Well, welcome everybody to this fine Tuesday afternoon stuck in traffic. So today, I think this will probably conclude like it, you know, all the games I've been looking at for the last you know, month or so about all been a, about attacking chess. And um, before that starts to get old, I mean, I, I wanted to show this one game. I, I remember this game from when I was a child. Um, you know, it's a, it's a famous Bobby Fischer game. I mean, I think everybody knows Bobby Fischer. Um, we don't need to talk about him. So it's a game he played uh, in a U.S. championship back in uh, 63 or 64 against uh, Pal Benko. And uh, I'm not sure if you guys know who Pal Benko is, um, Hungarian grandmaster who moved to the United States. Uh, I believe he still writes for Chess Life. He does, uh, he does a column for Chess Life every, every month. Um, the, the Benko Gambit is actually named uh, after him. So he's a very, very strong player in his own right. And, and this game is incredibly impressive to see how quickly Fisher just runs, at, runs right through him. So the game starts with a modern defense. And Fisher is always, always goes for aggressive options. He's one of the most aggressive players of all time even though he's positional he still is just very very aggressive and this was very much in fashion back then it, it still pretty much is so um, just trying to grab as much of the center as possible uh, control as many squares as possible and uh, you know just try to try to checkmate the, the black king so this is pretty normal theory here um, we get this bishop d3 move, again, just developing pieces. It's probably better on d3 than on c4, uh, because the, the, the play will actually happen here with maybe the pawn coming to f5. If it comes to c4, it actually is a target for a6 and b5. Um, there's some lines in the modern where the bishop on c4 is, is good, um, but it's probably better placed on d3. We should probably trust Fisher's judgment on, on that one. Um, so okay, so so, how many of you guys actually have played the modern defense or know any of the ideas in this at all, uh, or do you guys play the King's Indian at it's all? A lot like the King's Indian. Yeah, it's it's similar to the King's Indian. Actually, here it's probably very close to a King's Indian. Looks like we got to a King's Indian around. Yeah, well, except for the, the pawn is still on c2, which is which is actually a big difference. So uh, I could maybe play the pawn to c3 if I needed to. But but some of the ideas are the same. So. Do you guys know what the idea behind the move bishop g4 actually is? Yeah, so it seems like it's just like, you know, it's just a pinning move and it might be irritating. But it actually has a, a deeper positional uh, point to it. So the, black's play is, is actually going to be centered around the dark squares. So black wants to be able to put pressure on the d4 square and be able to also control the e5 square. Like, so they can maybe play moves like e5 or c5, and maybe they'll end up planning a knight on the d4 square. So the move bishop g4, so it actually has two positional purposes for it. So one is what I just mentioned, is trying to trade it so they can actually control the dark squares in the center and loosen white's grip on, um, on all the central squares. The second is, uh, is, is about space. So once black does play a move like e5, White will probably take space either with d5 or maybe f5, something, something like that. Black is going to have less space than, than white. And do you guys know what you're supposed to do when, when you have no space? Trade. trade pieces. Because when you trade pieces, then at least you've kind of given yourself more room to operate in some way, and your pieces aren't falling uh, all over each other. So that's, just, that's the point of bishop g4. Uh, a lot of the times in many openings, you'll see like these little mysterious h3 moves. And h3 is just all against that bishop coming to g4, not because the pin is irritating, but because it's designed to trade on f3 and then control the dark squares. So it's kind of a, a, a deep positional idea. So Fisher, you know, being a grandmaster and, and uh, you know, just being a reasonable chess player in general, he prefers bishops. So with this trade, black is able to accomplish the plan that I was just talking about, but it gives white a few, uh, gives white a, a one nice trump, and that is uh, he gets the bishop pair. And the bishop pair unopposed is very, very powerful. Um, and we will see, we'll see that in this game actually quite, quite, quite a bit. So 
black follows up with their plan, you know, quite naturally. Knight c6, we're just going to pressure the pawn on d4. So how are we going to defend this? Bishop b3, easy, right? It's develop pieces, control squares. So what is black going to do here? So based on the plans that I just told you and what black's trying to do, what do you think they're going to follow up with? E5. And it looks a little, this is, this is one of those moves that's kind of weird for, um, you know, class players to make. You know, it's like, I'm going to throw a pawn out into, you know, being attacked by, by two pawns. It's kind of an awkward looking move because you have to calculate what happens if white takes twice and releases the tension and all that kind of stuff. But it, here, it's, it's by far the best move and it, it's consistent with the strategy that we were just talking about. So the question is here, and one of the reasons I really liked this game was um, I, I thought about this position a bit, and I started to think, like, how would I play this position? And Fisher played it differently than, than, than I, I thought I would. And, and I learned quite a bit, actually, just by thinking about this one position um, for a little while. So if you guys had the choice, what, what is your move for white here? Like, how do you respond to this move e5? Castle. So, so castle we could castle. We could castle, but then maybe pawn takes d4, wins a piece. Oh, so that might not be ideal. Yeah. So we we probably have to respond to that threat, and so well, we we have to take the pawn. Or push. Or or push. Um. So yeah. So we have three options. We have d5. We have d takes e5 and f takes e5. So what do you guys? What would be your? What's the most natural move here to you? Like, what would you guys play if it's a blitz game with one minute on your clock? Take. So you would take with what? So you would take with the D-pawn. That's interesting. What, do, what would you guys do? F-pawn? D-pawn? F-pawn is a blitz game. So F-pawn if it's a blitz game. How about you, John? Uh, I like F-pawn if it's a blitz game. I think I'd take with the D-pawn. So it, it's, it, it's interesting. Here, my initial reaction is I thought I would take with the F-pawn. And, and taking with the F-pawn is actually a fine move. And... Um, the idea was like if we if we were to do f e5 d5, they're still no matter what we do they're going to sink a knight into d4. But I always I feel like I should be capturing towards the center and keep my pawns in the center and keep control. But what Fisher shows in this game is that um, d takes e5 is actually a superior move. I mean not not so much superior, but it's actually the more aggressive option. And to me it's it's a little bit counterintuitive. Well, you can potentially cast the queen side, getting the a rook on d, opposing the queen. Yeah, it ha it has actually it has more dynamic potential than than the f pawn. And even though the f pawn, you know, you open it up the f file, but opening up the d file may actually be very useful. And we still have a way to open up the f file, <clears throat> so it, it's kind of nice. So here, black clearly has to take back. There's still now notice one of the drawbacks of taking back, you know, taking with the d pawn is we've opened up the queen, can now actually take, controls d4 as well. So when the knight, the, black is going to have superior control of the d4 square. So they're winning this, the, the battle for the d4 square. But that's okay. We, white still has ideas of their own. So what do you think, now that we've gone de, de, what is white's next move? We know that black's next move almost in almost any case, it's probably knight d4. But should that worry us? What what should be our plan here? You talked about being able to open up with playing f5. Yeah, f5. Is it too early for that? Well, so that that's a that's a really good question, right? Um, and it's actually yes. <laughs> so so white. This is the the point in, in white's play there. They're going to play f5. They're going to threaten to maybe take on g6 someday, um, but maybe not right away. Um, that, that seems good, too, because now that pawn is stuck on e5 where it's blocking. It's blunting, it's, he's blunting his own darts for efficient. Yes, uh, which, which matters, to, matters to some degree. Although, um, So what black wants to do in this position is, so yeah, it's blunting the dark square bishop, but I think this bishop's role in the game right now is to help support the d4 square when the knight comes here. 
So that means we have to do something with this knight. And where do you think that knight is going to go? Where is he going to feel comfortable? If you could pick this knight up and place it somewhere on the board, where do you think that knight would go? So, no, I mean, it's a, D7 is fine. It's, it's maybe not doing the best job, right? So from D7, it's, it maybe is helping control E5. But uh, maybe the c5 is uh, not a, not the greatest square for us. Um, it turns out, and this is a, this is actually a cool maneuver, and, and you'll see later in the game, Black's idea is to actually go knight e8, knight d6, with the potential of playing f5 at some point. It's a it's a cool little cool little thing. So so you want to be able to keep these plans in mind as we go through the rest of the game. Uh, it's not what happens immediately. But um, but it's important just to see what it is that that white uh, that black is planning to do as well. So in this position, Benko plays g takes f five, which is kind of an odd odd move to me, um, and it's definitely not the best move. Th the best move in this position was to actually just follow up with the plans we were just talking about. Knight d four. So if black did play this way, what would you do as white? So that's a really menacing looking knight, right? We don't really want to tolerate it. So the question is, should we take it? So, so this is actually, a good, this is a very common theme in chess. Like you'll see these types of positions where a knight comes in, you're able to chop it off and white and black gets his pawn um, in the center. But what else would that do for black's pieces? If we were to decide to just do bishop takes d4 here and e d4, so we'll have like a move like knight e2. But notice what this did to all of white's dark squares. So now we have this nice e5 square where our knight can now, now going to d7 is actually a really good idea because I have both of these squares as an option. My bishop all of a sudden has a little bit more scope. The pawn's not on e5 anymore. And I can start pushing pawns. And, and black's position is actually much, much better. And uh, sometimes this is, this is hard to calculate. Um, you just have to have a feel for why you absolutely should not make uh, a move like that. Bishop takes d4. Um, you, or at least, I wouldn't say absolutely, but it's something that you, now that you see kind of what the consequences are, you should be thinking about this in your own games. About like, should I really take that? Is that as good as it looks? Because that knight looks really strong, but that's okay. We can actually we could tolerate it. But first, what Benko wanted to do, I think he was maybe a little uncomfortable with the with the tension uh, on here, not knowing when White might actually crack this open. They might play Bishop G5 at some day, or maybe G4 is the next move that he's afraid of, right? Because White also has on tap here ideas of G4, G5, and then maybe F6 and the whole position's in a bind. So before that happened, I think Benko wanted to make sure that that wouldn't happen, and he took on f5. So how would you take back? With the pawn or the queen? Queen's sort of untouchable. Well, no, the knight can... And the knight's going to come to d4, which actually also will attack f5. Yeah. So you could take with the pawn, um, which seems like it actually gives your pieces more scope, right? But you're giving up the center. And black may have a well-timed e4 someday, and all of a sudden all their pieces are running wild all over the board. Um, so for that, probably for that reason alone, Fisher took with the queen. And then Benko actually follows up with the, with the the right plan here, knight to d4. Uh, so Fisher retreats with queen to f2, just you know, keeping keeping the eye on the knight. The, the queen was attacked, so we have to drop back. And now Black goes for this for this idea that I was talking about before. They want to put the knight on d6 and then play the move f5, where they'll actually start opening up the f file. Right, you have the queen kind of eyeing the queen from behind the pawn. And, um, you know, it might actually liberate black's position quite a bit, right? It's like similar to King's Indian defense type positions where you're aiming for f5 the whole game. So, so that's kind of the idea 
here. Um, but Fisher finds finds some beautiful ways to actually to uh, take control of the game in, in a really just fascinating way. So in all of the other games that we've gone over in the last month, I've stressed pretty much development at all costs, right? Get an edge in development, king's somewhere really vulnerable, kill, kill, kill. Unfortunately, not all of our games have those... Um, those scenarios, right? Black is not dangerously de behind a development in this game like the other ones we looked at, um, like in Geller Smyslov and um, you know the Nesvaginov game. Um, here, Black's looking fine. Their pawn structure is a little funny. Their king maybe does look a little funny, but I wouldn't say that they're in terrible strategic danger. So you actually have to generate some something here and put your pieces on the on the right squares. So yeah, so let's think of some candidate moves here. So we had queenside castles. You could kingside castle. I mean, what else? What 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 pieces of yours aren't playing the way that you want them to play? So light square bishop is probably not ideal, um, or so it looks right now. So so this is one of these positions that this is actually where um, you know masters and then grandmasters even beyond that. This is where they make their money, is in positions where there's so many different options, choosing the right one is extremely hard. And Fisher is a master of something called the initiative. So do you guys actually know what, you've probably heard the word before, like chess players are always talking about, well, I grab the initiative, right? And Grandmaster is always a fighting for the initiative, but do you guys know what that actually means? Do you know what the aggressor? Yeah, it's pretty. The initiative is pretty much the making threats, like be, being the one who has the ability to make threats, and you're continuously making threats. So, here, if White were to pa passively play, so let's just say Queenside Castle, which seems like an aggressive move, Black may actually be the one who takes the initiative with a move like f five, um, or or maybe Knight d six and f five, right? So. What if you start to play a little bit slowly, like naturally but slowly, you might find yourself getting in some trouble. So Fisher finds a really cool way here to just seize the initiative and not and pretty much not turn back the entire game. So let's think about some other moves. What move here can White play that actually might start making threats? Bishop C four. And what is Bishop C four threatening? The F seven. Okay, is that a real threat? Maybe not. Because, because if we go bishop c4, they'll play knight d6, yeah. attacking our bishop, yeah. and they're definitely taking the initiative. This might end up being on like your, your eighth move, tenth move you would consider in the position. And, and the whole strategic idea behind this plan is, is so brilliant. Um, Oh, well, so first he goes castles. Sorry, I, <laughs> I, I had it. It's okay. He castles, gets his king safe. Now knight d6. And now the move that I was trying to coax you to play. Queen to g3. What's the idea behind queen to g3? Pins the bishop. Pins the bishop. What are we threatening? Bishop h6. Yeah, bishop h6 may not feel that comfortable, right? Yeah, the knight is attacking plus Yeah. So black has to, has to play king h8 pretty much. Now, we were talking about initiative, right? And sometimes you need to take time out of your plan and, and out of your game to prevent your opponent from making moves that will steal initiative from you. And what is the move that I keep on saying that Black really wants to play? F5, F5 right? It'll free, it'll free his position. So can we prevent F5? Or even discourage it. Is our thought of sacrificing three positions? All right, we, all right, maybe we're getting that's a little too crazy. Yeah. Um. So it's actually a really easy move, and sometimes like 
the really simple move, like the simple solution to that. And 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 actually, the theme of this game, when I get to like the real position, the real position I wanted to talk about, it's it's all about chess problem solving. So we have a problem. We don't want them to play f5. So what do we have to do to prevent them from playing f5? Yeah, we we need to put a well, we need to put a piece that controls f5. We don't have a piece that can just land on f6 right now, like rook f6 or something that just gets chopped off. So we just need to actually attack f5 again. So what move can actually attack f5 again? Queen g5. Queen g4. Really interesting. Like, it's very, very simple. I just move my queen up. But it has a dual purpose. And what do you think that dual purpose is? Just thoughts. Like, what do you think Fisher's thinking here? What is he trying to do? Where is the queen going? Because it's clearly superior on g4 compared to g3. But is there a square that's even better for the queen than g4? h5. He's gonna. St he actually wants to checkmate. Fisher's Fisher's brutal. So he's trying to go after the black king, even though right now it looks like there's no absolutely no way to do that. And from h5, he'll also control f5. So black plays c6 here because they, they don't want to allow knight d5. That could potentially be kind of annoying. And well, as you guys guessed, Fisher just goes queen h5. So think about that. For, what a cool maneuver. He goes queen g3, queen g4, queen h5. Three consecutive queen moves, all one square at a time. Most powerful piece on the board, and he's moving it around like, you know, like a king. But if you compare this position to the one here, where neither side has really made a lot of progress, the queen is much better placed on h5 than it was on f2. Yeah, you could get rid of the e4 pawn. Yeah, you're right. So now we're thinking about right, now you're thinking the way that Fisher is thinking, the way the way that I, I want you to think in this position. It's about chess problem solving. We want to be able to get rid of the e4 pawn somehow, and so that we can you know get rid of it and checkmate on h7. So we need to just start thinking about ways to do that. Here, the knight settled down on d5. Oh, um, okay, knight knight d5 is maybe an option. They, they can they can straight up ignore to, that. He doesn't have to take taking the knight on d4. Doesn't okay, look as bad anymore. so yeah, so now taking the knight on d4 doesn't look so bad. Oh, okay, so let let's try and calculate that a bit in our heads first. So if we go bishop d4, e d4, what is your follow up? Knight e2. So you're just going to go knight e2, and then maybe he gets a chance? E5. Pawn yeah. up to e5. Yeah, so we might want to consider e5, right? Yeah. But e5, how do you respond to the move f5? So if we go bishop d4. Whoop, sorry. Uh, it's black to move here. Sorry here. Yeah. But we're, this, we're thinking about ideas. If we were just our move here, we'd want to go you know, bishop d4. Uh, ED4, E5, threatening checkmate on H7. Right, so Black's thinking about defense here too. So they're calculating this. If you go for that line, Bishop D4, ED4, E5, they want to respond with F5. And we already saw this move Queen E8. But the idea is that when you play E5, I can play F5, and you don't have time to take back because I can take your queen. Right, so so that's like a really sneaky defensive move, right? So you could go and you think I'm going to play this brilliant bishop takes d4, e5, and I'm checkmating you, and then all of a sudden f5 hits the board, and there's nothing left to your attack, and black is probably much better. So what do we do? So we have the right idea in mind. We want that e4 pawn to be gone, and we want to be able to try and checkmate on h7. So we need to kind of construct some some fantasies in our head for how how this actually works. <clears throat> so what what makes Black's defense possible here? There's only been one move they've been fighting for the whole game, and only one move that makes the entire game possible. F five. Yeah, so maybe, you know, your idea, a natural idea is trying to double the rooks, something like that. Um, so Fisher does decide here to chop on d4, and e d4 is forced. So we would love to play e5, but again, f5 
is crushing. Black actually is much better if we go e5 right now. So what is holding black's position together? Everybody say it. What move? Okay, so now we're going to be problem solvers. Can you prevent the move f5? So g4, you still... It, it does, and you're still, when if black ever plays f5, um, the queen is going to be attacking your queen. So they, they're pretty much going to force the trade of queens there. So what do you say, knight, knight e2? Yeah, well, knight e2 because our knight is attacked, right? Also, we have to consider that our knight on c3 is also hanging here. But my knight's hanging, but I still want to prevent f5. Because if I go knight e2, then maybe the move f5 is, is really annoying. And black will probably be, be better if we allow this. What if the move f5 were illegal? e5 would just be winning, right? Like, do you see a way that they can prevent checkmate if, uh, if, if f5 were suddenly an illegal move? It's probably hard for, for black to defend if, if f5 were actually an illegal move. Yeah, if it's not there. <laughs> what an absolutely ridiculous move, right? Yes. Could, could you imagine being over the board and your opponent just puts their rook on f6. You'd be like, oh, this is awesome. Are you rated 1,000? Like, you know? Yeah, okay. So, so you're starting to see it. Um, so the idea here, clearly, is if bishop takes f6, e5 is unstoppable mate. You can't, you can't prevent it. I mean, you could start throwing pieces in the way, knight of 94, knight of 5. Eventually, you're just going to get checkmated. Um, so that's pretty cool, right? So, so clearly, the rook is absolutely taboo. So there's another move you could try. You could try uh, h6. So what do we do? What can we, how can we follow up here? So rook h6 is, is definitely an option. And then on um, bishop takes, we go queen check, king g8. And now, yeah, it's pro it might be good enough. I, I can't remember. I feel like there may actually be a problem with rook takes h6. Probably involving f5. Oh, I think if I go if I go rook takes h6 right away, I think I can ignore it. This is right. I think I can ignore it and play f5. Because um, the knight actually does a good job of controlling the c4 square. So yeah, so so rook h6 right away may not actually work. So how would you respond here to to h6? So can black take the rook still? So that's a question you've got to ask yourself pretty much every, every move along the way. Is, is my rook still immune? Absolutely, right? Be because I just still will play e5. Or if they even take, it's even a quicker death because I'll just take on h6 with check and then play e5 and it's over. So their knight is also hanging on d6. Should we take the knight? I might lose my knight, and they all, and they may also end up getting f5, right? Because I've moved my rook away from its awesome square. So I don't want to do rook takes d6. Let's play, yeah, let's play e5. And what am I threatening now? Well, so now, yeah, I, I am threatening the knight, but now I'm actually threatening rook takes h6. Because then it'll be a, a very swift checkmate. So like, let's say they punt. Let's say, oh my god, my, my knight is under attack. Let's move it to c8 or something. Then this, so you, you'd, well, actually, there's even better here. You can just go queen f5, unstoppable mate on h7. So actually, once you even see this, the knight on d6 can't move either. Because if the knight on d6 moves, I have queen f5, unstoppable mate. And so that means you can't take... Uh, you can't take on c3 because if they take on c3, then I just go rook h6, and clearly bishop takes, queen takes is mate. If they go queen g8, then I can just simply go rook h8, and after this, that's mate as well. So okay, so lots of moves that we can't play for black. 
Uh, so let's find one. The one that Benko chose was king to g8, because it at least avoids rook h6 check. Um, so now, how does white force the end of the game here? And notice now that the, the rook, can the rook still be taken? Probably not, right? Yeah, let's see. So if we if we just, I'm sure taking the knight is probably fine. Do I have a response to that? To e d six. The the move Fisher played was actually really funny. Uh, I thought it was a really cute finish to the game. Um, but e d six may work, and I'm sure once I go and look at this after the fact, I'll have to annotate the YouTube video again to say, like, ah, well, Rob just doesn't know how to calculate in person. So, it, you know, it's a horrible move. Um, uh, it shouldn't, actually, yeah, ed6, we have queen e3, and then queen g5. Right, so do you see that? So if I come here, then I have queen e3 check. Um, so that could, that could be problems. So, um, so yeah. So here, the move that Fisher plays is a simple knight e2. And Benko has to resign. He actually can't move any of his pieces. <laughs> right? You can't move the knight on d6, so it's lost. Right? Because if it lo if, if, if it moves, I just go queen f5. If you take the rook, then, I mean, I just win a thousand different ways. Um, but one of them is just queen takes h6 with unstoppable mate on h7. Uh, if, you know, if the queen moves, then so what? Um, I simply just I can just take the knight now, and I'm just up a bunch of material. So, I mean, it's a nice short and sweet game. And luckily it was a short one, uh, given that everybody showed up really late today. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, let's let's look at this game again really quick, because I, I just thought there was a couple really instructive moments um, that Fisher just... It just looked easy, right? Pal Benko is, is an extremely strong Grandmaster. And, and Fisher just walked right through him in 21 moves like it was nothing by playing moves that just seemed effortless and then finding some ridiculous rook sacrifice on f6. Like, if only our games were that easy, you know? Um, probably happens when you're the best player, one of the best players of all time. Uh, so, yeah, so we get this modern defense. Again, the Austrian attack. White's trying to play for control of the entire center. Black is fighting against them this way. One, to gain space by trading on f3, but also fighting for these dark squares. On, on d4, e5, c5. But white appreciates his position because they like the pair of bishops. Uh, and so it, it's a strategic tr struggle there. So black goes about their business, just trying to attack our dark squares. And white, play, white plays a really interesting way. This seems counterintuitive uh, by capturing away from the, the center of the way that's maybe more natural. Uh, but he does this so he can get this this f5 lunge. Um, we get into this, knight d4, queen f2, knight e8. So we were talking about the idea was to put the knight on d6 so they could push f5. So the entire game was about this struggle about can black get away with f5 and can we ever stop it? And Fisher showed that he could stop it um, and, and won a really nice game. So castles instead of queen g3 right away. Uh, but now knight e6. Now we go about this little maneuver of taking the initiative, right? Always look for moves in which you can be the one creating threats. So white just makes a threat of bishop h6. Black has to respond to it. Now we actually take away their ability to play f5. And we're going to put our queen on a better square. Right, c6 to try and limit our pieces. Queen h5 puts us on a better square and sets up this tactical shot that I'm sure Fisher saw coming from a mile away. And now after this move, it's just chess problem solving. I want to be able to play e5 and checkmate you, but you have the move f5. How do I stop you from playing the move f5? I'll give you a rook to stop you from playing the move f5. Right? It, it sounds really easy when you you know when you see it now and we, we talk about it, but um, I'm sure if I were to you know had if I was playing this game and I looked at my heart rate, it would be something like 175. Right? <laughs> it's like, well, all right, let's see if this works. Hopefully, it does. Um, and now. It's just really cool calculation. And black is in Zugzwang, pretty much, on move 21 uh, on an open board. 
and he's getting checkmated or losing a, a boatload of material. So I thought that was a really a fun one. This will probably be the the last of this uh, attacking game series that that we'll do. I'll probably switch uh, and do some lectures on positional chess, like when to trade pieces and and other cool strategic positional play. But uh, I, I would be um, upset if I didn't at least show one Bobby Fischer game in you know in, in the last month. So hopefully you guys like this one. <laughs>